For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Flash floods are merciless forces of nature, wielding the power to obliterate everything in their path without remorse. They strike with sudden ferocity, catching unsuspecting victims off guard and leaving destruction and devastation in their wake. Those who underestimate the dangers of flash floods do so at their peril, for these torrents of water spare no one and show no mercy. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Flash floods can transform tranquil streams into raging torrents within minutes, sweeping away vehicles, homes, and lives with terrifying efficiency. They're raging bullies that appear out of nowhere, fueled by fury and debris. Six inches of their fast-moving rage can knock you flat, and a foot can snatch your car like a toy. Don't underestimate their deceptive calm. Dry washes turn into churning rivers in a heartbeat. Flash floods are rapid and destructive floods that occur suddenly, often within minutes or hours of intense rainfall or the sudden release of water such as from a dam break or the melting of a snowpack. These floods can overwhelm rivers, streams, and drainage systems, leading to a rapid rise in water levels and causing significant damage to infrastructure, homes, and even loss of life. Unlike typical floods, which develop over a longer period and are often more predictable, flash floods catch people off guard due to their speed and intensity. They are particularly dangerous because they can occur in any region, not just those prone to flooding and can strike with little to no warning, making them one of the most deadly natural disasters. In the face of a flash flood, there is no time for hesitation or complacency. Only swift and decisive action can offer any hope of survival. To ignore the ominous warnings of impending floods is to gamble recklessly with one's own life and the lives of others. In the unforgiving realm of flash floods, ignorance is not bliss. It is a death sentence waiting to be carried out by the relentless currents of nature's fury. For the Basinger and Smith families, their flash flood ordeal would be a nightmare. Carrie Basinger and Candace Smith have been friends since 2010 when they first crossed paths at a dental office where Candace was the office manager and Carrie worked at the front desk. Carrie tied the knot with Shane Basinger in 2000, while Candace married Anthony Smith in 2003, with Shane playing a significant role in the ceremony. Despite their contrasting styles, Anthony favored neatly pressed preppy attire, while Shane preferred Carhartt jeans and a cap, the two men formed a close bond over their shared love for the outdoors and strong family values. Both Shane and Anthony had teenage sons from previous relationships, further intertwining their families. As their families expanded, Candace and Carrie had children of their own, and weekends together became even more cherished. Candace and Carrie delighted in watching their children grow and play together. Every summer, the Basingers and Smiths made it a tradition to vacation together at the Albert Pike Recreation Area, managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Nestled amidst the rugged Wachita Mountains and traversed by the gentle currents of the Little Missouri River, the Albert Pike Campground draws families across generations year after year. Here, children spend hours at the swimming hole while their parents enjoy the ambiance of the lazy river and the seclusion of remote campsites. Offering 54 campsites divided into four designated areas, the campground caters to both tent camping enthusiasts and RV owners alike. The Smiths and Basingers typically usually camped at a privately owned Lowry's Camp Albert Pike RV Park and Cabins nestled on both banks of the river just south of the federal land. Lowry's draws a loyal following of families who return year after year, some opting for RV accommodations while others retreat to cozy cabins. Arriving at Lowry's on a Thursday afternoon, June 10th, the Basinger and Smith families found themselves faced with a dilemma when the older boys expressed a desire to camp in a tent, a lodging option not permitted at Lowry's. Reluctantly, they relocated to Loop D at the federal campground, feeling a twinge of disloyalty despite reassurances of being able to return to their site from Jesse Lowry, the owner of the RV park and a close friend of Shane and Anthony. Resuming their camping adventure at Loop D's site number two, the Basinger family included Carrie, Shane, Kyler, Shane's son from a previous marriage, and their daughters, Jaden and Kinsley. Meanwhile, the Smith family comprised Anthony, 
Candace, Anthony's son, Austin, from a previous relationship, and their younger children, Joey and Caitlin, along with Austin's friend, Brady Pate, 15, joined the group. On June 10, 2010, while Carrie and Candace prepared dinner, Shane and Anthony took the children for a swim. Along the banks of the Little Missouri River, the Basinger and Smith youngsters frolicked joyfully despite the looming clouds, heavy with rain. The threat of inclement weather did little to dampen their spirits. Following dinner and showers, the children settled inside the family's RV, where they watched Madagascar and engaged in video games. As was their custom, the two mothers tucked their excited children into bed, calming them with gentle whispers and lullabies before stepping back outside. By the time the women retired to their beds at 11 p.m., the men followed suit shortly after. While Candace and Carrie slumbered deeply, the intermittent rain of the day escalated into a torrential downpour. Shane, feeling uneasy due to the thunderstorms, dozed off sporadically, waking repeatedly to monitor the weather conditions. Despite the presence of Forest Service staff at the campground earlier in the day, neither Shane nor any of the other campers had been informed about the issuance of two flash flood watches, followed by a flash flood warning for the area. As the storm persisted, Shane's apprehension grew. He eventually rose from the bed, informing Carrie, I'm fixing to tell the boys to get out of the tent. He presented them with a choice. He offered the shelter of either the RV or Anthony's pickup truck. Opting for the truck, the boys made their decision. Similarly, most of the other tent campers at Loops A and B, located just across the river, also chose to evacuate their campsites. At 11 p.m., forecaster John Lewis began his shift at the National Weather Service office in North Little Rock, settling in front of his computers. Despite the office's broad jurisdiction over weather monitoring in Arkansas, overnight shifts were typically uneventful. However, Lewis anticipated a busier night ahead due to a large storm system they had been tracking over Texas for the past two days. This system caused significant flooding in central Texas on June 9th with up to 10 inches of rain inundating campgrounds and neighborhoods along the Guadalupe and Kamal rivers. As Lewis began his shift, southwest Arkansas had already experienced intermittent rainfall. Shortly after 1 a.m., a thunderstorm with intense lightning appeared over Polk and Montgomery counties, prompting Lewis to issue a flash flood warning for parts of Garland, Pike, Polk, and Montgomery counties at 1.57 a.m. near cities like Glenwood, Caddo Gap, and Langley close to the Albert Pike campgrounds, were particularly at risk. Meanwhile, the Forest Service, historically focused on forest fires, did not closely monitor weather unless during dry spells. District Ranger Gloria Chrismer, over 100 miles away, paid little attention to the flash flood watches issued that day. A few minutes after Lewis issued the warning, State Police Sergeant Brady Gore was roused by the steady patter of rain on the tin roof of his family's cabin near the Albert Pike campgrounds. He had made a last-minute decision to join his wife, Gina, there. The cabin nestled on Lowry Land had been in his family since the 1960s, and Brady had spent countless childhood summers there. Groggily, he thought to himself, man, it's really pouring, I bet the river is rising. Although he had witnessed heavy rain before, Brady had never seen the river significantly breach its banks. Even the Lowrys, whose family had owned the land since President Rutherford B. Hayes granted it to them in the late 1800s, had only experienced one major flood event. Brady resolved to check the river's level on his way to work in a few hours before rolling over and drifting back to sleep. Meanwhile, Bill Paxton, owner of a cabin at Lowrys, also awoke around 2 a.m. He ventured outside to relocate his truck and lawnmower to higher ground, feeling the water swirling around his calves as he returned to his cabin. Concerned, Bill decided to monitor the river level closely, switching on his outdoor lights and brewing a pot of coffee. At that moment, a flood gauge located downstream registered the river level at 4 feet or 1.2 meters. Standing on his balcony with a cup of coffee, Bill, whose cabin stood on 8-foot stilts, pondered whether he should have elevated the cabin even higher. Back in North Little Rock, Lewis retrieved a state atlas from the shelf and commenced examining the terrain around Langley, where the storm was intensifying. Immediately, he observed that numerous creeks and streams fed into the Little Missouri River just north of the Albert Pike Recreation Area. 
Additionally, he noted that both the river and campgrounds were situated in a valley, suggesting that runoff from the mountains could significantly contribute to flooding. Unbeknownst to forecasters, the river was already experiencing a rapid rise, climbing nearly a foot in just 15 minutes. Initially, trees and debris acted as makeshift barriers, temporarily containing the rising waters. However, as these obstructions gave way, the Little Missouri River surged forth, creating a mountainous wave that was barreling towards the Albert Pike campground. Reuben and Catherine Cleveland, aged 70 and 78 respectively, served as volunteer camp hosts at Albert Pike. Their camp host duties had never prepared them for the chaos of a surging river and panicked campers. So when a group of distressed individuals banged on the door of the Cleveland's 1985 Toyota motorhome around 2.30 a.m., they were uncertain how to respond. Call somebody, one man shouted. We're all gonna drown. Despite arriving at Albert Pike on May 24th and having prior experience as camp hosts, the Clevelands found themselves facing unexpected challenges. Like many others, the Clevelands were oblivious to the area's flood risks, as the Forest Service had not erected any flash flood warning signs and visitors often disregarded threats of rain or storms. Equipped with maps, emergency phone lists, registration envelopes, a first aid kit, and a landline telephone. The Clevelands relied solely on their landline for communication due to the lack of cell phone service. Unlike other campgrounds they had hosted at where rangers or park personnel remained nearby, Albert Pike's Ranger District office was nearly 40 minutes away and closed by 5.30 p.m. Unaware of the flash flood warnings issued for June 10th and 11th, and with no emergency or evacuation plan in place, the Clevelands were thrown into panic when campers sought refuge in their motorhome. With the district office closed and no employees available, Catherine dialed 911 at 2.38 a.m., feeling the motorhome begin to move as she made the call. Get somebody out here in a hurry, she pleaded with the dispatcher. We're all gonna drown. Minutes later, county deputies were en route to Albert Pike in response to the Cleveland's distress call. Bill Paxton remained on his balcony, his anxiety mounting as he watched the water rapidly rise. Suddenly, he witnessed RVs floating past, a terrifying sight that prompted him to contact Lowry's owners, Denver and Janice McRae's, who were sound asleep in their home, situated safely above the river and away from the cabins. At that moment, forecaster John Lewis had focused his attention on the Albert Pike Recreation Area, correctly deducing that the warm weather had attracted campers for a prolonged weekend. He promptly issued a flash flood statement, an update to the earlier warning specifically targeting Albert Pike, before initiating calls to the sheriff's offices in the areas most severely impacted. Upon confirmation from the Montgomery County dispatcher that water had begun to inundate Albert Pike, Lewis sensed an air of nonchalance, as if flooding at the site was commonplace. Despite his suspicions, the dispatcher did not convey the severity of the situation to Lewis. By 3 a.m., the Langley gauge registered a water level of 10 feet, four feet higher than half an hour earlier. Within the next 15 minutes, the level surged by nearly three additional feet, causing creeks to overflow and block access roads to Albert Pike, hindering rescue efforts. By 3.30 a.m., the gauge had reached 14 feet. Meanwhile, Sergeant Brady Gore and his wife Gina were abruptly awakened by frantic pounding on their back door. Get up, get out now, a voice shouted laced with profanity. Alarmed, Gina initially feared a fire. Upon opening the door, they were greeted by the sound of rushing water, with two drenched and disheveled strangers on their deck, under the porch light. An apprehensive Gina demanded an explanation from the men, questioning if they were about to be robbed. Pointing his flashlight at the deck, one of the men indicated the encroaching water. Despite their cabin being situated on a ridge three rows back from the river, water was already lapping at the deck. Gina and Brady hastily dressed and fled through the front door, away from the river. As they made for their cars parked nearby, they heard alarming noises and turned to witness a neighboring cabin tear away from its foundation and drift away. Then a flash of electricity illuminated the scene below them, plunging everything into darkness. Candace Smith and Carrie Basinger were roused from sleep by their husbands amidst a cacophony of destruction outside. Just moments earlier, Anthony Smith had ventured out to check on the teenagers when he felt water swirling around his ankles prompting him to rush back to the RV and urgently warn the others. 
Peering out of their RV window, the two families were stunned by the devastation unfolding before them. Quickly gathering their four young children, they fled the RV and sprinted towards the safety of the Smith's Chevy pickup, desperate to escape the rising floodwaters. Though the truck started, water quickly inundated the cab. As the Little Missouri River surged through the campground, uprooting trees and carrying away RVs, Carrie Basinger turned to her husband Shane, expressing her fear that they might not survive. However, Shane reassured her with determined resolve, urging her not to alarm the children. Now huddled in the pickup's bed, drenched and shivering, the roaring river instilled terror in the children, prompting desperate screams. A sudden surge of water slammed another vehicle into the Chevy, pinning it against two trees, followed by an RV crashing into the trapped vehicle. Witnessing the trapped occupant's cries for help, Shane crawled onto the RV, attempting to rescue them amidst flashes of lightning illuminating the harrowing scene. Despite Carrie's pleas for him to return, Shane persisted in his efforts until reluctantly retreating. Carrie, holding onto their daughters, positioned them atop the pickup's toolbox and wrapped them in their beloved baby blankets, tearfully apologizing and professing her love as she braced for the impending disaster. As a towering swell of water engulfed the Smith's truck, Carrie clung tightly to her daughters as the tumultuous current carried them away. Carrie Basinger desperately clung to her two young daughters as the swollen river violently tossed and tumbled them all. However, the relentless current, capable of uprooting asphalt slabs as large as swimming pools, eventually tore the little girls from her grasp. Amidst the chaos, Carrie could hear Kinsley's desperate cries for help, pleading for her mother to rescue her. Despite her frantic efforts, Carrie could only yell back that she couldn't reach her. In the darkness, she caught a glimpse of her eldest daughter, Jaden, age eight, struggling to stay afloat and too far for Carrie to intervene, urging her to keep her head above the water. Repeatedly swallowed by the water, choking and gasping for air, Carrie found herself entangled in her pajamas, which the current violently ripped away along with her clothes. Debris relentlessly battered her and unknown objects repeatedly struck her head. Despite her attempts to cling to trees, the branches snapped, and the river mercilessly dragged her down into its murky depths. And in those harrowing moments, Carrie resigned herself to what seemed like inevitable fate, echoing the words she had exchanged with her husband moments before the floodwaters engulfed them. Yet, as she resurfaced, she couldn't help but think, if this is how it ends, let it be swift. Meanwhile, Candace Smith found herself separated from her children buffeted by the current as it slammed her into trees one after another. Cars and RVs swept past her in the river, one with its flashers blinking. Anthony managed to lift Shane's son, Kyler, into a tree, reassuring him that he wouldn't let go and urging him to hold on tight, promising that everything would be all right. Carrie found herself separated from both of her daughters as water filled her lungs, but suddenly the relentless current began to slow. Ahead, she spotted a cabin positioned in the newly carved path of the river. Approaching it, Carrie felt the river's hold loosen, allowing her to swim towards the structure. Desperately reaching for a windowsill, she realized it was too small to provide a secure grip. With determination fueling her actions, Carrie shattered the glass with her arm, creating a better hold as she clung to the window, screaming for assistance amidst the deafening roar of the river. Meanwhile, the residents of the cabins on Lowry Land were jolted from their sleep by two strangers, Matt Watley and J.D. Quinn, who appeared at their doors in a disheveled state. These young men, who had been drinking beer late into the night, had bravely waded through the rising waters, warning residents of the imminent danger and urging them to seek higher ground. Making their way through the deluge, they reached Brady and Gina Gore's cabin just in time as the floodwaters submerged cabins below. With the power failing and darkness descending, the Gores and other residents sought refuge at a small store uphill from the cabin, anxiously awaiting news of their fellow cabin owner's safety. Meanwhile, the river gauge recorded a staggering rise of nearly six feet, or 1.8 meters in just 45 minutes, leaving the survivors huddled together, drenched by the relentless rain and consumed by worry for their neighbor's well-being. Managing to cram about 30 people into the cabin well beyond the river's reach, this heroic act, alongside the efforts of the two young men who were up late drinking and a string of fortunate events, 
ensured the survival of everyone at Lowry's, both cabin owners and families in RVs. However, a bend in the Little Missouri had transformed Lowry's into a repository for the remnants of Loop D. Was that a scream? Someone asked as a cry for help pierced the night, seemingly emanating from one of the cabins below. Fearing they had overlooked someone, policeman Brady Gore dashed for his patrol car. Having been awakened by Matt and JD, he had driven up to the store earlier and now hurried back following the two young men as they sprinted toward the source of the screams. Upon arrival, they saw Kerry Basinger in a dire situation in a flooded cabin. They were 40 yards from the cabin, however the rushing water between them rendered any attempt to reach her futile. Hang on, hang on, the group implored repeatedly. Quickly returning to his patrol car, Brady illuminated Kerry with his spotlight before transmitting a message via his police radio. The dispatcher documented Brady's 4 a.m. distress call. Camping at Albert Pike and the water is rising. People are on their cars and campers. They need assistance. Someone is in the river calling for help. By then, the water level at the gauge had surged to 18 feet. At 4.30 a.m., it reached 21 feet, ultimately peaking an hour later at 24 feet or 7 meters. Clutching the window, Carrie's battered body hung over the water. Don't let go, a voice urged but a piece of floating furniture struck her fingers, causing unbearable pain. Reluctantly, Carrie released her grip, plunging back into the tumultuous waters. There's a pole behind you, pole, everyone shouted as Carrie desperately seized a wooden utility pole, embracing it tightly. Despite fearing the worst for her daughters, Carrie clung to hope, while survivors on the ridge above showered her with words of encouragement. As the water gradually receded, their shouts grew more fervent. Water's going down, you're going to be okay. Yet, as minutes passed without rescue, Gina Gore's frustration mounted. Where are they? When are they coming? She demanded of her husband, who somberly acknowledged the grim reality. They were alone in their struggle. Around 3.30 a.m., dispatchers received multiple 911 calls from the Albert Pike campground. Roger York, a seasoned firefighter, suspected a couple had attempted to cross a low water bridge in their RV and been swept away a scenario not unfamiliar in the area. However, when he reached Little Blocker Creek on Arkansas 84, the road was submerged under four feet or a meter of water, impassable. U.S. Forest Service Patrol Captain Jimmy Hicks faced a similar challenge, encountering flooded roads on his way from Glenwood to the campgrounds. After waiting for over 30 minutes for the water to recede, Hicks and his team pressed forward. York rendezvoused with additional firefighters at the Langley Fire Department, just six miles from Albert Pike. Led by Hicks, the convoy navigated treacherous conditions on Arkansas 369, circumventing fallen trees and obstacles. At one point, they encountered mudslides, with Hicks ingeniously clearing a path using an axe. Finally, at 5.34 a.m., the rescuers arrived at Loop D, the hardest hit section of the campground. As they approached, the area appeared to shimmer with light, initially mistaken for fireflies by York. However, they soon realized the glimmering specks were flashlights, abandoned by fleeing campers. Screams filled the air, and the chaotic scene underscored the severity of the situation. Barefoot and injured individuals roamed amidst debris and rising floodwaters, prompting Reuben Cleveland to offer assistance to Hicks. The rescue team, shaken by the unfolding crisis, grappled with the disaster's enormity Downstream at Lowry's Camp Albert Pike RV Park and Cabins, Carrie Basinger grasped onto a partially submerged utility pole, her lifeline after being swept away from the federal campground. A newly formed channel of the Little Missouri River separated her from a group of onlookers standing anxiously on the ridge above, urging her to hold on a little longer. Meanwhile, Brady Gore discreetly pulled his wife, Gina, aside to inquire if she had visited the federal campground the day before. Confirming that she had, he pressed for details on the number of people present. Gina, puzzled by his sudden interest, mentioned that the campground was full. Brady fell silent, leaving Gina perplexed. She, like everyone else, was fixated on Carrie's predicament, assuming she had been staying in a cabin near the utility pole. Gina's concerns had centered on wet and cold campers waiting for the water to recede. However, a chance encounter with elderly neighbor Loretta Wiley whose cabin had nearly been submerged, brought a sobering realization. Expressing a wish for the sun to rise, 
Gina was met with a grim prediction from Loretta, shaking her head and stating, Oh, honey, when that sun comes up, it's going to be a whole lot worse. Cohen Davis, a volunteer firefighter from Umpire Athens, was part of the initial team of rescuers who reached Lowry's. Upon observing Carrie's perilous grip on the pole, he immediately donned a life jacket, realizing the severity of her situation. Uncertain about Carrie's injuries, Cohen understood that if she lost consciousness or released her hold on the pole, she would be at the mercy of the unforgiving current. To secure himself, Cohen tethered to utility lines stretched between two sweet gum trees. Carefully navigating above the water, he steadily made his way towards Carrie, hand over hand. Upon reaching her, Carrie succumbed to her emotions, breaking down in tears. Cohen could see Carrie's arm had a bad gash, but it wasn't broken. Where's my two little girls and husband? Carrie asked. I don't know, Cohen said, tying a rope around her. Despite the rope and life jacket, Carrie refused to let go of the pole. You have to trust us, he urged. At that moment, in the distance, she heard a voice. Carrie, she heard the voice say. That's my name, she told Cohen. There's someone else left, she thought. Carrie, we're okay, the voice called again. With renewed hope, Carrie let go, allowing Cohen and the current to take her toward higher ground and later to the hospital. As the water receded, Candace Smith, Carrie's best friend, gradually descended from the tree she had clung to when the river swept her away. Like Carrie, Candace found herself separated from her husband, Anthony, and their two young children, Joey and Caitlin. Initially engulfed by the rush of water, Candace eventually heard voices as the tumult subsided and the sun began to ascend. These voices belonged to her stepson, Austin, aged 13, Carrie's stepson, Kyler, aged 14, and their friend, Brady Pate, aged 15. Candace called out to them and together they waited amidst the woods, anticipating the arrival of helicopters. However, the anticipated rescue remained non-existent, shrouded in silence. Overwhelmed by despair, Candace collapsed while the teenagers ventured off, Kyler and Austin seeking their fathers. Despite Candace's pleas, the boys persisted in their search for their missing relatives. It was Austin who eventually delivered the heartbreaking news about Joey's fate to Candace. He drowned. Determined to see her son, Candace followed Austin, who eventually led her to Joey's motionless form. Later, Caitlin's body would also be discovered. For almost an hour, Candace remained by Joey's side, unable to accept the reality of her loss. Across the rushing waters, a group of rescuers signaled their intention to reach her, but Candace refused their assistance, unwilling to leave her son. Eventually, a rescuer crossed the river using a rope and implored Candace to wear a life jacket as he helped her navigate the treacherous waters to safety, confessing, I just signed up to shoot a water hose. I never knew I'd have to do anything like this. Throughout the night, John Lewis, a forecaster with the National Weather Service, diligently tracked the storm system responsible for the flash flooding at Albert Pike. Critical information regarding these watches failed to reach the camp hosts or campers at Albert Pike, as Forest Service employees neglected to relay it. Despite the escalating flood threat throughout the night, no one from the Forest Service monitored the storm. Despite Lewis's efforts, including calls to sheriff's offices, assurances from dispatchers indicated they were already aware of the flooding at Albert Pike. The Montgomery County dispatcher appeared unconcerned leaving both him and Lewis unaware that Loop D and significant parts of Lowry's were submerged with campers struggling for survival. Lewis concluded his shift and headed home to relax with some television before bed. Lewis flipped through TV channels and saw a breaking news alert about the unfolding tragedy at Albert Pike. Hearing those words, his heart sank and he immediately called his boss, expressing his premonition about the event. Despite his efforts throughout the night, Lewis felt powerless a feeling that deeply affected him as someone dedicated to saving lives. Despite reassurances from colleagues and family, Lewis couldn't shake off the feeling of helplessness, leading him to cry for the first time in his career. For the next several hours, Candace and Austin sat on a bench outside the Lowry store, waiting. Surely Anthony, a rugged outdoorsman, had survived. Any minute, he'd saunter out of those woods. Time crept. Austin thought he heard his dad calling for him. No, baby, I didn't hear that, Candace said. The truth slipped into her thoughts. He won't return. This is it, she finally said aloud. This is all we have. No, her stepson protested tearfully. Dad's coming. Austin, look at me, Candace ordered. 
She struggled for composure for the right words. It's just us. Carrie Basinger was swiftly taken to the hospital by rescuers. Medical professionals discovered not only a deep gash, but also broken ribs and a concussion. It was there that Carrie received the devastating news of her husband and daughter's passing, while her stepson, Kyler, had managed to survive. In the aftermath of the flood, Carrie often doubted the reality of the voice calling her name, a sentiment she later shared with Cohen. He confirmed having heard the voice as well, providing some validation of her experience. The flood claimed the lives of 20 individuals, including children, making it one of the deadliest flash floods in Arkansas's history. The sudden surge of water during the pre-dawn hours caught many campers and residents off guard, leading to a high fatality rate and several injuries. In terms of property, over 60 campsites were destroyed or severely damaged, along with numerous vehicles, personal belongings, and infrastructure. The economic repercussions extended beyond the immediate destruction as the area suffered from a temporary downturn in tourism, a key income source for the local economy. According to the American Red Cross, more than 200 individuals were present in the affected areas when the flood struck. National Guard helicopters assisted in the search for the missing. President Barack Obama assured Arkansas of federal emergency aid if necessary. Emergency management officials highlighted the search and rescue operations challenges. The loss of a logbook at the Albert Pike Recreational Area further complicated tracking efforts. Additionally, flooded roads hindered rescue efforts, prompting some searchers to employ canoes or kayaks. The Arkansas Department of Emergency Management established a call center to field inquiries regarding 73 individuals potentially missing in the aftermath of the disaster. Following the tragedy, the U.S. Forest Service closed the site for further evaluation. On July 20, 2018, the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit upheld the dismissal of a lawsuit against the federal government related to the incident. The court ruled that the government could not be considered negligent for allowing visitors to camp overnight on a previously known 100-year floodplain as the June 10 flood was identified as a catastrophic 500-year flood event posing an ultra-hazardous condition, regardless of any mitigation or warning efforts related to the known 100-year flood risk at Loop D. The 2010 Albert Pike flood remains a tragic event in the history of natural disasters in the United States. The flood underscored the critical importance of preparedness and responsiveness in the face of natural disasters. The rapid onset of flooding, exacerbated by the geographical and infrastructural characteristics of the Albert Pike area, meant that campers and residents had little time to react. Carrie and Candace experienced the devastating loss of their husbands and two youngest children while their stepson survived. Carrie finds some solace in believing it's a comfort knowing our babies are with their daddies, that they're not alone. To this day, the pain of why they were the ones who survived perplexes both Carrie and Candace. They pondered how their husbands, who were much stronger, did not survive. They eventually realized that Shane and Anthony likely used all their strength to aid others. Now, Carrie and Candace feel a strong obligation to carry on that legacy of helping. They are determined to ensure the safety of Albert Pike, a cherished campground beloved by many generations. We don't want Albert Pike to close forever, Candace says. We want it to be open for thousands of people to enjoy like our families did. We want what should have been implemented done now. Since the flood, Candace and Carrie have made numerous visits to Albert Pike. In earlier times there, energetic children would have been scampering behind them through these woods. Now, butterflies gently follow in their wake. The first time they shared a laugh reminiscing about their children, a delicate butterfly fluttered above them. On a chilly November day, as they sat at a picnic table overwhelmed by their grief, yellow butterflies circled them. Once, while standing at a temporary memorial for their families, a butterfly landed on Carrie. It briefly paused before moving to the wooden plaque resting on the word, family. It then fluttered over to a cluster of flowers and subsequently landed on Candace. Returning to the plaque, it touched down again on family. For Candace and Carrie, this repetition seemed to deliver a heartfelt assurance from beyond. We're still with you. In the aftermath of a flash flood, the landscape bears the scars of sudden devastation. 
Homes once filled with laughter are rendered silent, stripped bare by the merciless rush of water. Survivors wander through the remnants, their hearts heavy with the weight of loss, as they mourn the irreplaceable. A poignant reminder of nature's unpredictable fury and the fragile thread by which all things hang. Surviving a flash flood requires quick thinking and prompt action. Keep a weather radio or an app that provides weather alerts. Flash flood warnings give you a heads up to prepare or evacuate if needed. If you are in a flood prone area and there are warnings of potential flooding, evacuate immediately. Do not wait for the situation to worsen as flash floods can develop quickly. Flash floods are extremely dangerous because of their rapid onset and powerful currents. If you're outdoors, move immediately to higher ground. Do not try to swim across floodwaters. The water may be much deeper and stronger than it appears. Be cautious of electrical lines and equipment nearby or in the water. Electrocution is a major risk during floods. Structures such as bridges, roads, and culverts can be washed away or weakened without warning. Avoid crossing such structures if they are above fast-moving water. Just six inches of moving water can knock you off your feet. Avoid walking through floodwaters where possible, as currents can be deceptively strong and waters may be contaminated or hide dangerous debris. If you find yourself trapped in a building by rising water, move to the highest floor or the roof if necessary. Do not climb into a closed attic space as you may become trapped by rising flood water. Watch for signs of a flash flood, such as rising water levels, an increase in water speed, or water that changes from clear to muddy. Also listen for unusual sounds such as trees cracking or boulders knocking together, which could indicate moving debris. By adhering to these tips, you can enhance your chances of staying safe during a flash flood. Remember, flash floods can occur with little to no warning, so always be prepared and vigilant, especially if you live or camp in a flood-prone area. Vital information so you can get through an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.